Welcome to Elite Academy 5. For those of you who have been to all five Elite Academies, the good news is you've almost qualified for a PhD degree. <laughs> for those of you for whom this is your first Elite Academy, you're probably going to be wondering what did I get into in about 10 minutes. To me, the the science is a very important part, and I think you all know that. And from the beginning of our MLM endeavors, I was committed and remain committed to teaching the distributors, educating all of you in the product that you're selling. I want you to understand it. I realize it's complicated. I realize it's hard for lay people to really get their arms around the science, but you guys have done an unbelievable job. I'm amazed at the, the, the level of the conversations I have with you that in the hallways now compared to what those conversations were like on, at the first Elite Academy or at the ribbon cutting. So bear with me, you're doing a good job, and believe me, it's going to be important in the end that we know what we're talking about. Having said that, I want to get started. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about <laughs> something that uh, those of us who've been in this company for five or six years uh, know as the Ohio State study. <laughs> it probably doesn't mean much to you if you've come in the last couple of years. The reason it's almost a cliche is this study started four and a half years ago. And about six weeks after it began, people said, you know, where's that Ohio State study? How's it coming along? This is the way science moves. It moves slowly and deliberately. It's been a long time. Uh, this study was published, uh, went online, uh, about a week before Christmas. It's still not there in its absolute final format, but it's in the public domain. And this is the study I want to tell you about today. It has a lot to do with heart disease and with heart surgeries in particular. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, try to stay with me. I'm going to do my best to get you through this. Most of us are familiar with heart surgeries because we've all got friends and family who've gone through heart surgeries. Uh, I think a lot of people can say the terms cardiac bypass surgery, coronary artery bypass grafts, uh, carotid endarterectomy, maybe. I'm going to tell you about that one, too. Um, when I tell you what it is, you're probably going to say, oh, I know people who've had that done angioplasty with stent insertion to keep coronary arteries open and the blood flowing. All of that has become a big part of our lives in the last two or three decades. And this study really relates strongly uh, to what's going on uh, in the realm of cardiovascular disease. This is the study, and I'm not going to jump into this right away. And if you read the title, you probably see why I'm not. The title is Protandum Attenuates Intimal Hyperplasia in Human Saphenous Veins Cultured Ex Vivo Via a Catalase Dependent Pathway. So, if, if you understand that, you're, you can go to the back of the room and you'll get your PhD degree right, right now. But by the end of this presentation, I'm hoping you will have some grasp of what this is about. I'm going to begin, though, because I know a lot of you are here for the first time. Uh, and I, for the last two or three Elite Academies, I've presented an extremely brief review for newcomers, uh, answering the question, what is ProTandem and what does it do? And it's still a question, and it's a very good question. I, I don't uh, belittle anyone who asks the question, what is ProTandem? Uh, and what does it do? And protandem biochemically is a NERF2 activator. Well, that probably didn't tell you a lot more than you knew before I said that. But what a NERF2 activator is, it's something that delivers a biochemical wake-up call to every cell in your body. 
that's what pro tandem does that's important and i want you to understand how it does that so here is how pro tandem works really in one single slide this big blue oval represents any one of the several trillion cells in your body and in the upper right you see that little purple item labeled protandum. That's one of the five active ingredients in protandum. And so every cell in your body, if you take a protandum, will be bathed in those molecules that make up protandum. The first thing protandum does when it approaches a cell is it binds to a receptor on the cell. Now, what is that? Well, if this cell is your house, what protandum just did is it stepped on the front porch and it rang your doorbell. Right, that's how the cell interprets that. When that happens at your home, things happen inside. You may get up off the couch and walk to the door to open the door and see who's there. When protandum rings the doorbell of the cell, something happens inside. That oval labeled a kinase, a kinase is an enzyme, it's a protein that catalyzes a particular metabolic reaction it's activated, just as the chimes inside your house are activated when protandum or someone steps on your front porch and rings the doorbell. Something happens inside. What that particular enzyme does, the one that just turned yellow, is it modifies a protein inside the cell. The, the, the protein that's modified is represented here by the little red oval labeled NRF2, NERF2. NERF2 is what biochemists call a second messenger. And to go back to the doorbell analogy, maybe your four-year-old runs to the door, opens the door, and turns around, runs to the kitchen, and says, Mommy, Mrs. Smith's at the front door. That's a second message, all right? So Mrs. Smith rang the doorbell, and something happened inside your house that sends a message Protandum does exactly the same thing. If you look at this uh, red protein, it now has a little yellow circle with a P on it. That P is a phosphate group. So chemically, the red protein has been modified. It's been held in the cytosol, the, the main space of this cell, by a blue protein called KEEP1 that's holding it there, preventing it, if you will, from running into the kitchen so maybe this is in the family room. But once it's been modified as a result of protandum ringing the doorbell, that modified NERF2, that second messenger, is now free, and it leaves the blue protein that's been holding it, and it finds its way to the part of the cell where the DNA is stored. And the DNA is really the central blueprint that controls everything you are, everything your body can produce. And NERF2, chemically modified, released, running to the, to the room where the DNA is stored, so this is your four-year-old running into the kitchen, delivers a message to the blueprint that really runs this cellular household. The DNA is comprised of 25,000 genes and they are blueprints that make every protein in your body, every enzyme in your body. This second messenger, NERF2, has been called the master regulator of survival genes. Survival genes are stress response genes. They enable the cell to get through tough times. Some of them are antioxidant enzymes, and we've talked about those from the beginning. When protandum started, what we thought it would do is upregulate, make more of two specific enzymes. And at the last Elite Academy, I showed you what we now understand about how it works and what it does. Protandum upregulates at least 400, maybe closer to six or 800 enzymes, not just the two we were originally interested in. Among those enzymes are survival genes of all kinds, not just helping you to survive oxidative stress, but helping you to survive traumatic stress. Cells get injured, they respond, organs get injured. 
blood vessels get injured. Today we're going to be talking about what happens when blood vessels are injured, and they can be injured by well-intentioned surgeons and physicians, and they respond in ways that can create problems for us. Problems not related to the original disease, but problems related to, to what happens next. When this messenger gets to the DNA, it finds every gene in the nucleus that's regulated by a certain kind of switch. Here it's labeled ARE. That's a switch. Every gene has a switch, just like a, every light fixture in your house has a switch. And the genes are expressed, their products are produced as that switch. It's sort of like a dimmer switch. As you turn it up, you get more production. You turn it down, you get less production from that particular blueprint. So protandum ringing the doorbell results in a reshuffling of those 25,000 blueprints in the nucleus of the cell. Hundreds of new gene products are produced, or more of them are produced. For another couple of hundred, they're turned down. Some of those are pro-inflammatory genes. They promote the inflammatory process. They're pro-fibrotic genes that cause scar tissue to be formed. So it's really a, a normalization in many cases, a readjustment of all the instructions being sent to that cell. That's what protandum does. That's how it works. The result is the upregulation or the increased production of all these protective enzymes called survival genes. This is a figure from the very first paper we published on protandum. And I'm coming back to this because it also relates in what I'm going to tell you today about heart disease. Here we're looking at a marker of oxidative stress, one of the most sensitive kinds of molecules in your body to oxidation is polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those are the things that make butter. Uh, it's a fat. It makes the membranes that hold your cells together. And if, if you leave a stick of butter on the table for a few days, it becomes rancid. It's interacting with oxygen. It's oxidized by oxygen. And it turns into a whole new set of products. Some of them are not tasty. Some of them don't smell very good. That's what we call rancidity, or rancid butter. And the same thing happens to the polyunsaturated fatty acids throughout your body when faced with oxidants, with free radicals. Here we're measuring that marker of oxidative stress in the blood of healthy people ranging in age in this study from 20 years old to 78 years old. And they're scattered around that line but the line is a mathematical linear regression line. It's sort of the average thing that happens there. And what you see is it, it goes higher and higher as you go from age 20 to age 80. And some individuals in the Middle Ages in particular are very different from others. So some of us sit on a couch and eat potato chips and watch TV. Others are training for marathons. And it shows in your levels of oxidative stress. Some of us take good care of our bodies, and some of us don't. That's why they're scattered. These people all took protandum for 30 days, and what happened is the levels of oxidative stress went from the red dots to the green dots. And if you look just at the green dots, you now can't really tell the 80-year-old from the 20-year-old. Everybody fell to that same low level of oxidative stress. And that's what we've been saying now for six years. And in this study, oxidative stress was lowered an average of 40%. If you were 78 years old, it went down about 70%. If you were 20 years old, it only went down about 20% because you were starting in a, a better place. All right, and what was measured here is called T-bars. That's an acronym for biobarbituric acid reactive substances, not so important, but those are the oxidized chunks of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So is that relevant? Does T-bars mean anything? This paper was published in 2004, 
and it says serum levels, blood levels of T-bars, predict cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. And the conclusions down there found that it was an independent marker. It was actually a better predictor of cardiovascular events. I've said before, that's not an event you want to attend. It's not an event like this one. A, a cardiovascular event may be an attack of angina, chest pains upon exertion. It may be a myocardial infarct that takes you to your knees. It may be fatal. So there are a number of kinds of cardiovascular events. The important thing is the higher the T-bars, the more likely a cardiovascular event was to occur. We've also talked in the past about how oxidative stress is hypothesized to give rise to atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, and plaque formation. Plaque is the, the goop that accumulates in an artery and eventually may clog it. So you get into trouble if that happens. Your heart muscle depends on oxygen. If it doesn't get enough oxygen, uh, that muscle has a hard time doing its job, namely pumping the blood. So this uh, figure, if you look at it from left to right, is kind of a timeline. So if you look at the, the beginning part of this art, this represents an artery in your heart. You see the first thing there is LDL. That's LDL cholesterol. That's a protein that binds cholesterol. We're all obsessed with what our LDL levels are. But LDL is perfectly normal. In fact, you die if you don't have any LDL. What's important is to keep it low. And why is that important? It's because if oxidative stress enters the picture, it leads, if you jump ahead a little bit, to oxidized LDL. And that's what many cardiologists believe is the real trigger to atherosclerosis. Also early on, you see those blue cells labeled monocytes. These are normal immune cells that can become inflammatory cells. And those monocytes recognize the oxidized LDL. So if free radicals are high, free radicals attack LDL, oxidize it, the monocytes eat that oxidized LDL. They actually fill up with little globules of it. And they become activated inflammatory cells and the histologists call them foam cells, which you see later in the sequence, because they look foamy. There are all these little bubbles of oxidized LDL inside the cells if you look under a microscope. And those foam cells deposit in the vessel wall, and you see there's now this thickening yellow, ugly uh, deposit. It contains foam cells, it contains oxidized LDL, and it slowly starts to occlude, to close in the lumen of the artery. The lumen is, is the part of a pipe that's open in the middle. That's where the water flows through. If the lumen closes down because there are deposits on the walls of a pipe, then that vessel becomes compromised. And the real problem, the, the event that may be fatal, is when this deposition of this ugly yellow plaque in the vessel wall, when it breaks through that layer of Teflon that keeps blood from clotting, it's called plaque rupture. So if that layer of cells is breached and plaque rupture occurs, you will get an instant thrombosis, a blood clot that forms right at that spot, and that big blood clot will completely occlude the artery, and it may be fatal. So that's the progression of atherosclerosis. And we've talked before about how oxidative stress is involved in the early part of that process. But it's, ox it's also involved in the later part of the process, and that's where this Ohio State study comes in. So let's assume, again going from left to right here, that oxidative stress leads to atherosclerosis. It's a slow process. 30 or 40 years developing. Uh, an alarming part of this is that atherosclerosis begins with something called fatty streaks in the wall of an artery. They're now being seen in children as young as 10 or 12 years old. 
so they can begin in the first decade of life. It's a process that builds and builds, and by the time a person reaches 40, 50, 60 years of age, there's almost certainly evidence of atherosclerosis, probably in everybody in this room. It's a time bomb. And help, <clears throat> uh, lifestyle can help prevent it. Good diet, exercise, all the things you hear about can help slow it down. And it doesn't have to be the thing that does you in in the end, but it's a process. It's like if you build a new house, 20 years later, the pipes will be rusty and there will be some corrosion and deposits. It might be still fully functional, but that, that happens. All right, so if atherosclerosis leads to partial or complete blockage of arteries, you go to a doctor either for a checkup or because you're having chest pains or for one reason or another. And if it's bad enough, there are three common surgical interventions that can occur. One is a coronary artery bypass. And again, I think you all have heard about people who have that. It's extraordinarily common surgery these days. Another procedure done by cardiologists without so much invasive surgery is angioplasty, and that's threading a balloon into that blocked artery, inflating the balloon. You can open it up. These days, initially, it was just the balloon. And it was found out, sure, you can stretch that artery open if it's clogged by plaque, but within a month or two, it starts to close down again, not surprisingly. Now, what's done is a stent is inserted, so I'll tell you about that and show you some pictures of a metal stent that, once the artery is opened up, can help keep it open. It also has uh, consequences and has medical problems produced by the surgery itself. And finally, carotid endarterectomy refers to the carotid arteries, big arteries in your neck that take the blood supply to your, bl to your brain. Very important arteries, obviously. They too get clogged with plaque. And so you may, have, you may know family members or relatives or friends who've had carotid endarterectomy. What the surgeon does there is he literally temporarily bypasses the clogged part, opens it up, and just scrapes out the gunk, and I'll show you a disturbing picture of that <laughs> later on as well. All right, all three of these procedures have failure rates. They're not complete permanent solutions to the problem. And if you look at the 10-year failure rate, 10 years is a long time for a, a surgical procedure to improve your quality of life. But with coronary artery bypass surgery, after 10 years, up to 50% of the grafts have failed. They're either almost completely blocked again, or they have been completely blocked. And so often, coronary artery bypass surgery has to be repeated, or some other, one of these other procedures sometimes can help. With stents and angioplasty, they don't even last that long. Sometimes four or five years is about what you expect from a stent. And I'll show you the reason they fail. And the same with carotid endarterectomy, a, a little better result there, maybe 30% failure rate after, after 10 years. But what we want to look at is what causes that failure rate. And it's our old nemesis, oxidative stress, again. Oxidative stress leads to something that was in the title of that Ohio State paper, intimal hyperplasia. So I'll show you what that means. And that's really the culprit that causes those opened vessels or bypassed vessels to clog up again after some years. Intimal hyperplasia is the problem. And what causes the intimal hyperplasia, at least in the context of the Ohio State study, was shown to be oxidative stress, something protandum can help with. All right, what, is, what is, does, do those words mean, intimal hyperplasia? It's simply a thickening of the wall of the blood vessel. So you might wonder, why didn't I say that in the first place? If you look at, if you look at the cross section of a blood vessel, what you see is there are several layers. If you cut a, a copper pipe open, there's just one layer. It's copper. All right, that's the wall of that pipe. If you cut an artery open, you'll see there are three distinct layers. So the, the pink circle in the middle is the lumen. That's where the blood flows through the hole in the pipe. 
And the innermost layer is called entoma, which means innermost, all right? Physicians have a way of making things uh, more complicated than they should be, maybe. The media is the next layer, that pink layer, and that means middle, or the one in the middle. And the outer layer is called adventitia. So there are three distinct layers. What happens when the intima uh, proliferates? If that middle layer, st those cells start to divide, what happens is the wall, that inner part of the, the lining gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And here you see it protruding into the lumen. If this happened all around, the lumen would get smaller and smaller and smaller. The media also gets thicker, and cells in the medium, largely smooth muscle cells, and some of those will migrate into the intima. So you get this thickening of the wall that can occlude a vessel. Intimal hyperplasia, this wall thickening, is an iatrogenic condition. What that means, you, you may go to your doctor for some procedure, you go back a month later for a follow-up, and he may say something like, well, you have an iatrogenic infection, and it's, you're probably thinking, oh no, an iatrogenic infection. <laughs> what that means is he caused it, okay? He, he, <laughs> and, and not, not intentionally, it may have just been accidental, but iatrogenic means physician-induced. And Dan Royal can probably tell you there are lots of those things that are physician-induced because a lot of the procedures have consequences. And intimal hyperplasia is one of those consequences. So it's not done on purpose, and it doesn't require a, a, a malpractice attorney or anything like that. But it is caused by the procedure. All right, here, here are actual arteries. The upper picture is a cross-section through a saphenous vein, this one is from a pig, and you see those, it looks very much like the, the little diagram I showed you. So there's a big opening in the middle, that's the lumen. There's a dark intimal layer, a lighter colored media layer, and an adventitia around it. So that's a healthy vein on top. No intimal hyperplasia, a thin lining. And that vein normally lives in an environment where the oxygen concentration, that's what PO2 means, is about 25 torr. That's how we measure oxygen. So the oxygen level here is 25. That vein deals with taking used blood back to the heart. That's why it's got low oxygen content. But the vein is built to live in that environment. The vein at the bottom is same vein, saphenous vein from the same animal. And this section of the vein was cultured at high oxygen, 125, so it's five times higher. And that's close, that's a little higher than artery C, but it's close. Arteries normally see 100 torr concentration of oxygen. So that's the difference between veins and arteries. Veins carry low oxygen blood, arteries carry high oxygen blood. And oxygen, believe it or not, is toxic. You may think oxygen is good for you, and it is good for you, you die if you don't have oxygen. But m you might be surprised if we took a, a healthy young adult rat who's breathing here at sea level, an atmosphere that's 20% oxygen, 21% oxygen. If we put that rat in a plastic box and we gave him 100% oxygen, which is only five times more than normal, in 72 hours that healthy animal would be dead because oxygen is that toxic. Five times more would destroy his lungs and the animal would die. So when a heart surgeon, and I'm gonna show you pictures of how this happens, takes a piece of a vein from your leg and uses it as new plumbing to go around an artery in your heart, he's asking a vein to do an artery's job and it's gonna see much higher oxygen than it's used to seeing. And it does a good job, but it pays a price and it suffers. Why is artery bypass surgery done? If this represents, here in a very simple picture, an artery in your heart, and you develop plaque over the course of 10 or 20 or 40 years, again, you see the lumen of the artery is closing up, and the artery, by the way, is at 100 torr, it's high oxygen. So the 
the surgeon will take a piece of vein from your leg and just like a plumber might put in a new pipe around a clogged, if, a, if, if a, you have a drain pipe and a tree has grown through it with roots, you'll put in a new piece of pipe to bypass the problem, the obstruction. And that's what this vein is used for. So on the surface of your heart, you have a bypass around it. Now, the problem is that vein, which should be seeing oxygen at a level of 25, is now seeing oxygen at a level of 100 causes oxidative stress uniquely to this vein, and the result is the walls of the vein thicken and will eventually obstruct the lumen to the point where it may close up and clog. This is a picture of a heart that's just undergone triple bypass. You hear double, triple, quadruple bypass. That means how many clogged arteries had to be bypassed. All right. And the most important one is usually that one labeled LAD, the left anterior descending coronary artery, because that takes blood to the, really the part of your heart that does the heavy lifting, that left ventricle. So it's got, got to supply that part that contracts to pump the blood through your body. In the last decade or two, surgeons have avoided the use of veins as much as possible. And so what you see going to that LAD is an arterial graft. So that artery has come from your chest wall. It's been dissected out by the surgeons. And the reason he's using that, that's an uh, interior thoracic artery. It's a little redundant, so your chest wall gets by without it. The surgeon can relocate it, and that's a, an artery supplying a new blood supply spliced into the uh, coronary artery. South of, the, south of the obstruction so that the, the muscle below the obstruction now gets new arterial blood supply from an actual artery, All right? It's a good solution. That artery is more stable than veins because it's used to seeing the high oxygen. This is a triple bypass. <clears throat> so there were two other blocked arteries on this heart and you only have one thoracic artery so you can only use that artery once. In this case, there are two vein grafts. So vein was harvested from this patient's leg, and you see there are two vein grafts that are spliced in at the top end. You can see there to the aorta, so they get new blood supply. And at the other end, which you can't see in this case because they're on the other side of the heart, they're spliced into also two more blocked arteries. Right? Those veins are gonna be more problematic than the artery. The artery has a 10-year failure rate, maybe as low as 10 or 15%. The veins, 50% or more, will fail by 10 years. So that's, that's the problem with this surgery. So where does the Ohio State study come in? And I'm going to quickly take you through the results. It measured the wall thickness in human saphenous veins that were going to be used for surgery. The surgeon removes more than he needs because you... You don't want to run short of pipe if you're a plumber. So there's leftover, there's leftover pipe every time a, a person undergoes bypass surgery. That's what was used in this study. They were incubated either at low oxygen, and that's described here as the freshly isolated. They don't change if they're incubated in low oxygen, or at high oxygen. And after two weeks incubated, where the only variable really is high oxygen, you get intimal hyperplasia, you get wall thickening. So this was done outside living people, in a laboratory model. And so the blue bar is where the intimal thickness should be if you're looking at the A panel. The red bar is after two weeks at high oxygen and the wall has already thickened several fold. And the green bar is the same kind of a culture except protandum has been added to the culture medium. And so even in high oxygen, the protandum-treated veins have avoided intimal hyperplasia. They, the walls have not thickened. They're staying at the same thickness as in freshly isolated healthy vein. Here we're measuring the intima, panel A, the media, the next layer, and panel B. And what you can see is with protandum in the diagram on the right, the, the Intima and the medial layers are still thin. There's a big opening in this pipe. It's conducting lots of blood. 
The bottom picture is what happens if the thickening occurs, the red bars, and you can see that the, the, the area, a cross-sectional area is reduced maybe by 80% in that diagram, so very little blood is now able to get through. So protandum has blocked this process that's really the bane of cardiac surgeons because they can do their surgery just fine, but it's the consequences, even years, begin sometimes weeks or months, but certainly by years. Um, I think I'm not gonna dwell on this. I don't want to turn you into histologists and these pictures may be ugly. But if you look at just A, B, and C and you say one of these is not like the other, you might pick, you might pick the middle one. So even if you don't know what you're looking at, it certainly looks different. A is a healthy vein, freshly isolated. C is a vein incubated at high oxygen in the presence of protandum, which looks a lot like A. The one in the middle that looks bad, and it has, you can see there, a neoentomal layer, and it's very thick, so there's a lot of vessel thickening happening there, prevented in C by protandum. Um, if you look at the number of cells that are actively dividing, Again, freshly isolated, healthy vein, very few dividing cells, incubated in oxygen, high, where it's gonna see it if it becomes an artery or a replacement for an artery. A lot of dividing cells, that's required for that wall to thicken, it takes more cells, they're multiplying and uh, getting thicker and thicker. Protandum, the right bar, completely blocks that intimal thickening. If we measure free radical production in these veins, uh, A, B, and C are again fresh vein, B is cultured at high oxygen, and C is high oxygen with protandum. And what we're looking for is the red fluorescent stain. So you can see in the red one, in the A, A panel, very little evidence of free radical production. B, a lot of it and C incubated with protandum for the two week period back to the A levels. So it's blocking free radical production by scavenging those radicals. They're quantified in the bars on the right, so in the, the, the color code is the same. Blue is healthy, red, high oxygen, green, high oxygen with protandum. So again, we see the protection. This is looking at lipid peroxidation marker. This one is very, closely related to T-bars, which was in our original study. It's a specific component of T-bars for H&E. And again, look at the level of 4-H&E in the blue bar. That's healthy. High oxygen, but with protandum, it's even lower this time than the blue bar. It's better, off, it's better than new. It's better than uh, the freshly isolated vein. But without protandum at high oxygen, you can see a lot of this lipid peroxidation product, maybe five times more. And why, why is this, the vein protected with protandum? Again, it's the same old story you've heard about in other studies. Three important antioxidant enzymes have been sharply upregulated. Again, the blue bar is normal healthy vein incubated at high oxygen, uh, the cells haven't induced the enzyme to protect them. But if we add protandum, the green bar, all three of these enzymes are dramatically induced to provide the protection that you saw in the previous slide. This is another measure in this particular case, catalase was focused on because there's a convenient specific inhibitor of catalase. Turned out that catalase is absolutely sufficient, uh, sorry, absolutely necessary, but not sufficient necessarily to provide the protection. But see, catalase is a key enzyme. That's one of the two we began this quest of protandum studying, and it turns out to be uh, certainly very important. So the conclusions are, that the saphenous veins used in arterial bypass surgery suffer from oxidative stress, and that's no big surprise, due to the higher concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood that they're now asked to carry. As a consequence of the oxidative stress, intimal hyperplasia or thickening of the wall occurs, and that can eventually lead to reblockage or restenosis. You may have heard that. Uh, that term used, restenosis simply means that 
what was blocked and opened up is now reblocked. And the important part for us, protandum prevented this wall thickening in saphenous veins cultured at high oxygen, suggesting that NERF2 activation may extend the life of arterialized veins in vivo. And I want to show, um, kind of out of time, but I want to mention angioplasty very quickly. This is a blocked artery, <clears throat> and you see it longitudinally and in cross-section with a big yellow plaque that's occluding part of the uh, lumen. Here, um, a catheter has been threaded into the, up through the aorta and into the to coronary arteries. And this is a very thin looking wire, but it has an inflatable balloon on the end. And outside the balloon is a little collapsed wire cylinder. This is like if you took a piece of chicken wire and made a cylinder, you could compress it down into a very thin rod. And if you inflate the balloon that's inside, you can expand that cylinder. So that's what the surgeon does. He locates this where the plaque is, inflates the balloon, and you can see that wire mesh cylinder now being ex inflated, expanded. And that holds the vessel open without that wire stent. That's what a stent is. Without the stent, the vessel would collapse when you deflated the balloon, or at least largely. And so, here, after you expand the wire, the wire mesh, you deflate the balloon, pull it out, and now you've got an artery in the picture on the right in cross-section that has a, a wire cage holding that plaque against the wall, making sure there's a big lumen. The unfortunate part is this is six months later. These are from pigs. And on the left, you see a lumen that is wide open and those little black dots are actually the wires in cross-section of this stent that's been expanded. So you can see it holding that vessel open. If you come back and look at another pig with another stent, but after six months, look at the difference. You can see that light pink tissue labeled intimal hyperplasia. That's a proliferation of cells that in only six months has closed that lumen down probably 80%. And that's the iatrogenic problem. It was created by placing the stent. The stent did a great job initially, but this is a problem with, and this is a bare metal stent. One of the ways um, medical device companies have responded to this is many stents are now coated. They're called uh, drug eluding stents or coated stents. And they are, have time release chemicals that inhibit intimal hyperplasia on the metal frame itself. That lasts for a while and it improves things maybe for a year or two, but not for the really long haul. So, so intimal hyperplasia is a real problem. Finally, this is carotid endarterectomy. The other procedure, this is the big arteries in the neck. And this is an actual picture of what uh, a frequent location for the plaque develop is a fork in the road. So this carotid artery has a branch in the side of your neck. And that's where plaque often develops. This is what it looks like if the surgeon opens, <clears throat> opens that artery it looks like a big chunk of a cheeseburger caught in there. Um, and what, what they do <laughs> is they literally, <laughs> literally scrape. If you had a cheeseburger for lunch, I'm sorry, but <laughs> they literally scrape that out and sew the artery back together. And it, it works with, with highly su uh, high success rate. I said after 10 years, about 70% are still fine. But that's a traumatic event for the artery. It's been opened up, the lining scraped out. And so these, when they fail, it's usually due to intimal hyperplasia as well. And so finally, <clears throat> whoops, I th thought there was one more slide, but maybe not. Uh, the implication is that one and a half million people a year undergo this procedure. And that's a huge, a huge number of people who have processes going on that are almost surely going to lead to failures of uh, these carotid arteries, bypass surgeries, the angioplasty, the coronary artery, endarterectomy, a big market for something that can help
prevent intimal hyperplasia. And I think you're connected with a product that might be really useful to do exactly that. So sorry for overtime. Thank you very much. <laughs>